but with the uh, kind of evaluating the last album, the evolution of this, uh, this satanic majesty's request, how, you know, the original idea, how it got started, uh, how long it took. T too long. <laughs> um, I don't really know how it started. It didn't sort of, it wasn't very strange involvement. And I don't really know what the end was. You know, it's just a sort of thing that was, which is what we were going through at the time. Um, and we had a lot of problems, and they just all came out on the album. There were problems on the album, problems on everything. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of made this album, which sounds like a sort of elucidation of a problem. But I don't think the next album will be a sort of going on top of that. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it will be sort of another layer of icing on top of that at all, and because um, that just reflected what we felt during that period, you know. And I think... Brian Jones is on the phone. Hi. <laughs> I think the next one will be very different, mm -hmm. but um, I don't really know. You did everything on this. You put the cover together. You, uh, I've seen pictures of you actually preparing that. Uh... Other disasters, <laughs> yes. I know. We had a great time. It's like being at school, you know, sort of little bits of paper cutting it out and making mm -hmm. little colleges. And well, this is quite different, though, musically, though, from, from what you've done in the past. It was quite kind of an abrupt change, wouldn't you? Yeah, I guess it was. I don't know. It wasn't really very abrupt for us because it was over such a long period. But... But uh, I guess it was, yeah. But um, as I say, I don't, I don't think it was very lasting uh, to us. Mm -hmm. to f uh, the music was not, it was very groovy, but um, I think we can do much more interesting things than that. This fellow in the Crawdaddy, and by the way, he seems to follow uh, Keith Altham, uh, review in the yeah. Musical Express. Yeah. He says that he feels that you heard Sgt. Pepper, but that the albums are not anything alike. In other words, uh, it it's your own entirely there you know naturally there have been comparisons made by various people yeah of course so well, I did um, Sergeant yeah. Pepper and what have you yeah I think that's sort of I mean yeah that's very superficial but I don't I, I see what I mean but um, I don't think it's like Sergeant Pepper really Sergeant Pepper was a, a collection of a clever collection of songs and I think it meant something to that Beatles, you know. I think it it was a definite transition for them. Uh, which, on their last things that they've done, on the Magical Mystery Tour, you can see it sort of, they're more or less the same, you know, sort of not quite as good as Sgt. Pepper, more or less the same, you know, the new things they do. But, but for us, that was just a period, you know, and uh, I think the next one would be very different to that. Well, is it true then, uh, I think we've noticed with Lennon and McCartney that their music is becoming more personal, certainly. Penny, uh, Penny Lane is more personal, say, to McCartney than uh, three or four years ago the songs might have been. Do you feel that's true? That I don't know, man. I don't know what they felt three or four years ago. And they might have been very personal, but I want to hold your hand. Mm -hmm. you I don't really know. I think one didn't think about whether it was personal or not then. Now, it's much more... Um, pretentious way of looking at things so that you think that oh this is personal or not personal I mean then quite often the music was incredibly personal uh, adolescent sort of scene but you didn't even know you know you were writing it totally from personal experience and that's why the contact was so great mm -hmm. <laughs> right what about the interaction between the two groups now of course the, the, you've been foremost for gee, three or four or five years um, you both made uses of uh, the Baroque influence, for example. Uh, you both have gone into, I think, the uh, some Indian music, the use of the zitar, etc. Yeah, there, we didn't do that. Any, right? there any action like that? Yeah, yeah, well, we've done uh, lots of things together. You know, we've been together a lot, and sometimes, and sometimes we haven't seen each other for months. We're in one of those periods at the moment. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. We we are having, a, and during the last year, we were playing a lot together and uh, doing a lot of things together. And it made very, some very interesting scenes, you know. And then, but there's lots of other people. I'm not the person I admire most is Bob Dylan. I was going to ask you about Bob Dylan. I mean, as far as personal and all that scene's concerned, mm -hmm. even though musically it might be... Um, it's interesting, but ra rather uh, stagnant, I think. I don't know. And not musically, I just mean superficially on the sound of what it sounds like, you know. It's not, yeah, mind-blowing sound-wise, but just mind-blowing word-wise. Well, he's had some Before incredible effects lyric-wise, too, I think, on everybody, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Of course. I mean, everyone's been sort of totally freaked out by him, you know, and including the Beatles.
you know, before that everyone was going on very, very simple things, you know. Now everyone's trying to be complicated and uh, it doesn't always come off because you can't be like Bob Dylan. You have to be your own thing. How do you go about writing a song, Mick? Are, are you and uh, Keith writing more independently or do you write uh, together? Yeah, or? we write, do both. We write a lot independently. A mm -hmm. uh, lot of both together. I think the best things always come out when you, when you have an idea that more or less comes from both of you mm -hmm. and you can work on it. Now, in a rehearsal like this, do you get together and uh, more or less in your head work out the arrangements, or have you done Well, a very primitive uh, time in rehearsals, because <laughs> we haven't played since uh, for a month. Well, we haven't played together for a month, because mm -hmm. we've all been on holiday. Mm -hmm. So we're just doing anything. We're not doing anything specific. We're just loony, just looning down here. We're having a nice time, nothing particular. Well, how would a song take, for instance, just to kind of give me an idea, how you work like she's a rainbow? How would a song like that evolve? That's a very sort of bad way of doing it. I mean, we did those things in the very bad. That's why I say about this album, it's totally. I mean, it's not how I like it to be done, you know. Well, let's she's a take rainbow the was. Then. It was she. Was she's a rainbow was. All those songs were done very strangely, mm -hmm. and um, they were all done the opposite way around. Mm -hmm. I consider they should be. <laughs> Unavoidably, I mean, I kept changing them. I mean, we changed them so much, so many times, and that I don't like that. I like it to be sort of a spontaneous thing, but that it, not many of those things were spontaneous, and they were done all reverse order. That we used to, we we laid them down as blues sometimes, like two thousand light years from home. Mm -hmm. Which is you're very loud to that microphone, Stu. <laughs> Well, what song could we take for an example? I'd like maybe uh, let's take something like uh, Lady Jane. Oh, that was yeah, that's a good example. Okay. See, yeah. that's a great scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lady Jane, I'll be very serious. It's very early. Right. Uh, um, yeah, that was a sort of spontaneous song that just came out. Keith wrote the song immediately. I wrote the words just together with it. I can't even remember it. It's one of those you just can't remember it. it being done. It just was not there one minute, and the next minute it was all there, and it was just all finished mm -hmm. in about ten minutes. And uh, it's nice. Uh, well, then, when when you move it on to the group now, there's the score oh, yeah. done. Uh, you no, then Keith just lays it down, and we just work out a few things around it. We arrange around it. Mm -hmm. If we want anything else on it, we have it written down, and we write it down for mm -hmm. the people who are going to play. Mm -hmm. It's very simple, really. But quite often, we would get into a studio with an idea of not of a totally defined song, and just throw it around. It comes out totally different mm -hmm. than what we imagined, which is a Nice way of doing it, but I'd still rather do it the other way. <laughs> what about the scoring when you have, uh, say, additional instruments? More well, we can either score group. it ourselves um, if it's brass or if it's violins or something. We'd like to use someone, a friend of ours, to write the arrangements. Now. Mm -hmm. I mean, to what we more or less want them to sound like. But we always change them much to the consternation of all the string players have to change them their things because they don't like changing their top lines but they do because quite often it doesn't come out right. Was Painted Black another one of those spontaneous things or did it come mm, out? Yeah, more or less it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a good one. <laughs> uh, the changes in the Stones' attitude, for want of a better word, I guess philosophy or outlook, as reflected in the songs over the period of time of four years. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> 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 as reflected in the songs, not, as yeah. in other words, I'm not interested in anything outside the music. I can't that? remember them. In t I can't remember these songs that we're supposed to have written in time sequence. I, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, it, it's not. I don't really. Uh, there is a conscious flow, I suppose, of change, but most of them are very that split second. You know, when you feel, you know, that, or you feel, oh, that's nice, you know? or you really feel. Mm, and and they come out. That's when they come out because you still have mood, you know, with your general feeling of uh, towards things is is a sort of sympathy with people. You still, I still manage to feel in my sympathy with people to feel very annoyed. And uh, then you write songs about it. I don't think uh, you should just write songs about being uh, totally so sort of covered in. Uh, in sympathy for your fellow man, that you can hardly get any other idea out of your head. You know, mm -hmm. there are other things that happen. You know, I, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I'm I'm still very sort of uh, I like. To, you one always does what you feel that is best for you, groovy for you. I like doing songs that, that uh, put things down as well as things that things that 
show that uh, you're in love with somebody or you love somebody. I like to get everything in, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I admit that there's a sort of total bitter, uh, bitter youth thing disappears, lump appears in his throat. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it it does, of course it has, but um, but I just still feel very mad. And so this, I don't know, man, I can't see these things like other people can see them at all. You know, I just go leaning on my merry way. It was just interesting, I asked Paul Simon the same question, and he said, well, obviously the change is between 22 and 24. <laughs> yeah, it will. change reflected, you know, in, no, in no. what we've done. I don't know. Well, I didn't change between 22 and 24. Uh, uh, 21 and 22. <laughs> Paul Simon. <laughs> if we may go back to the start of this thing uh, and talk a bit about the uh, evolution of your own uh, vocal style now, I've seen quite a few changes. <clears throat> what about the early... You, you've gone over these, I'm sure, in other magazines that I missed out on. But who were some of the people... Uh, American or otherwise, who uh, kind of turned you on at the beginning? I know I've heard you sing a number of um, oh, um, Howling Wolf and uh, Muddy Waters, mm -hmm. Elmore James, uh, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, all those people. Hey, I don't, everybody knows that. What did yeah, What did these people really have? Uh, that, that, uh, what, they had a nice sound and uh, some really alive kind of sounds. They made them nice, and we just made them more sort of just made them for ourselves we couldn't do them so, like they did them so we just made them very youthful i think was the thing about them very youthful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything about them was just very enthusiastic and uh, so were we we were very enthusiastic we still are but in a different way you know mm -hmm. obviously we're not in the same way enthusiastic anymore you can't be <laughs> I think. Well, it's interesting because the Americans, uh, Lou Rawls had uh, more or less dismissed this music, you know, gone on to something else, the teen whiners and uh, the terrible music we had in the early 60s. Uh, and yet you people had such an interest, or uh, even a, more of an understanding, I think, of this blues music than the Americans had. Do you have any ideas as to why? Uh, no, I, don't, I think that's true what you said, even though it sounds very strange. There's not many Americans, certainly not many of the teenagers I met when I first went to America knew anything about it at all. No, I mean, not in the slightest. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do now, which is very groovy. Mm -hmm. But they didn't then. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know why. Uh, there wasn't very many people here who were interested either. Mm -hmm. um, it was very... Uh, once you discovered it here, it was very difficult to do anything about it. This was kind of... You're really up against it, so it made it more interesting. Whereas in America, you could have easily bought all these records here. You couldn't buy any of them. So it made it another totally different, that strange adolescent scene where you like to be up against a brick wall over everything. And so, you know, if you're up against a brick wall about getting your records, you know, to get a mail from America, mm -hmm. it makes it all so much interesting, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and more and more strange. And and you get more and more strange about, uh, about it because you can't uh, really experience it at all mm -hmm. in any live form. So you get totally hung up on it. <laughs> I think that's... I don't really know why. But now you opened the floodgate for these these blues people. Well, they yeah. Say that, uh, they, uh, Muddy Waters told Lou Rawls in Chicago six months ago, he said, I've never made so much money in my life. And they credit that to the, what the, the British people did for blues. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> very groovy. And and I think that's that's great. And then, then when everyone's discovered that, you know, you should listen to those people. Well, still people write and say, why didn't you do this, why didn't you do that? And, which is true, we like to do those things. But um, there's so many people that can do it really well and who did it, they've been doing it for a long time, and very, that we can do other things, we like to do other things. You know? mm -hmm. And that after that first thing, all blues and change it all around and make something else out of it, which is what everyone's doing now anyway. Mm -hmm. you're st you're, now the title Rolling Stones did come from the Muddy Waters. Stones yeah, records. that's right. Is that, that right? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, well, that's what well, I mean. That's what I think so. <laughs> I've seen lots of other songs too, you know, but it's uh, it, that's where it came from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some high points now in the Stones' career. I wrote a couple down, and maybe you can help me think of some others. Uh, it's been pointed out, and I think it's very true that the Rolling Stones now on the Ed Sullivan album, show. Pardon me. <laughs> the Ed Sullivan Ed show. Huh? High point in my career. <laughs> Professional ambition. <laughs> right, and changing the changing the lyrics to songs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the Rolling Stones now album, which uh, came out, of course, I guess. Uh, Oh, what about 64? I in, don't in, know. In, anyway, yeah. it's been referred to by one critic as the peak and summation mm -hmm. of the young rock scene in Britain. 
And uh, do you have any comments on that? I can't remember that album because it wasn't in England. It was only America. Oh, that does make sense. That was one of those... I mean, they change everything around from America, you see, and I don't know which one that is. Mm -hmm. Which one is that, Stu? Sorry, I wasn't listening. Which one is it? Rolling Stones Stones Now, Now, it's called. I don't know. I um, I think... I can't remember, man. I think... I'm sorry, I really can't know what that one's about. Well, I know there is one, there is <laughs> definitely one thing that I have uh, been curious about. You guys were pioneers in doing the long track on the LP. You came out about the same time with Dylan, who did a long track. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea? I mean, had you seen another long track before that? No. Uh, in rock, or did you? No, we just wanted, we just did it. I didn't even want to do a uh, thing about it. We just, I think it didn't mean going home. Right. Uh, right. Well, yeah, we did that. Just, uh, just did it. I mean, we've done things long things before. That I mean, people they just fade things out. You know. Mm-hmm. I mean, lots of things go on for that long. <laughs> right. You know. I mean, on lots of other people too. You know, I'm sure. And um, but no one bothers to put it on records. You know, because they don't think it's worth it, or they can't get it on, or some reason. And we just thought, well, we just said we want it all on, man. <laughs> don't fade it out. So I said, no, you can't, you can't have that one because you said a word in the middle of it. I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> well, that's a, that's an incredibly important thing because I think the long LP track now is one of the reasons why we have so much more freedom and so much more creativity yeah. in the music. People aren't afraid. Well, to people were still putting, I mean, still holding themselves to singles, you know, while making albums, mm-hmm. and they still are. We still are. We, I don't know. We can't seem to find a medium to write the sort of two-sided pop thing in. To make it just one thing, you know, because no, I don't think there's been attempts at it, but it's not a definite style come out. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no use adapting pop to opera, it doesn't work. Pop to, you know, it just doesn't go, you know. I mean, Sad Out Lady the Loans was a very long song and very beautiful. But as far as just music concerned, like, uh, compared to to anything like an operetta or any form that's for a long form, a fugue or something. To make it sort of totally a pop form of music, mm-hmm. and not just to make it some gimmicky mixture of everything, slint, stunt, strung together with a lot of electronic noises, which which people, which is better than nothing. Mm-hmm. I mean, much better. Do you think there's a possibility that some of these people are going to become so esoteric that they lose absolutely any mainstream interest, and they find themselves suddenly outside the sphere of pop music with their symphonies and uh, yeah, Hugues and what have you that they're writing. I think so. I mean, there's a great sort of danger or liability for that to happen. I don't know. It's groovy that people will always want to do that, and I think they they should because there's plenty of people that want to stay in the mainstream it and write rotten little songs that sell a lot of records, you know. And everyone digs them, and, and people come along with little gimmicks all the time. Man. Um, it all depends what you're doing it for. If you're doing it to, first of all, if you're doing it to make money, well, it's not really a good idea. And if you're doing it to, to, to communicate your ideas to a mass audience, it's it's it gets more dangerous. But if you're just doing it for your own pleasure, you can surely do what you like. I think it gets very strong between communication and doing things for your own pleasure. <laughs> How about some recollections? Since this is a history show, uh, any high points or what have you of your uh, U.S. tours? Uh, it was quite a difference, I understand, between the first one and the second one. Mm, there's lots of different. They were all. The first time we came there, it was like a, a sort of cattle show, and the, and we went to some incredible places. That I can't sort of even. They were just all a lot of straw on them. A lot of people in the Midwest, sort of, you know, not knowing what was going on, and promoters losing enormous amounts of bread, you know. So it's not right. <laughs> but I, but, but I can't sort of. Great, some nice things happened. The Hollywood Bowl the last time we were there was enjoyed. I always enjoy the shows in Los Angeles. They've always been the best ones, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. They've always been the happiest ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've always been the tiredest ones because we've always done about sort of eight weeks of sort of walking across America before we get to Los Angeles. So we're absolutely hardly moving feet by the time we get there. But. Um, They've always been great, the ones in Los Angeles, I don't know. Is that a strange thing the first time through? <laughs> yeah, it was really weird. I mean, there was all these people trying to sort of... The, the herd of the Beatles who had only done two concerts in America, and so they were paying a lot of money for sort of English groups with long hair, you know, sort of. So they thought they were going to 
make an enormous amount of bread, you know, which they didn't, of course, make any money. Poor guys, you know. I remember playing it. I remember playing it. Do you remember that? I wish there were some other people here. I think we're going to wait to do some of it later. I think we'll do some more when some others turn oh, up. Oh, okay. okay. Because um, I feel like I'm going to sleep. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 